What you doing? Uh, no, 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 nothing, nothing. Let me see that. Nothing. Ah! Universe from nothing? What? What does that mean? I think it means the universe hatched from an egg. And who laid the egg? I think it's either a chicken or n- no- <laughs> nothing. And this passes as science on Earth? Sometimes, yeah. The theory that's at the heart of modern cosmology, the Big Bang, has only been around for about a hundred years, but has been gestating since at least the Enlightenment, maybe even since the dawn of humanity. But things really took off for the first time with the intellectual foment of the 17th century, when empiricism and mathematics began to displace mythological thinking with the power of reason and logic. Over the next 200 years, astonishing technical advancements flowed from the pairing of this novel quantitative logic with exacting observational rigor. Electricity, the assembly line, new methods of steel production, the germ theory of disease. Reason supplanted the explanatory role of religion, but at the end of the day, technological and scientific answers to cosmic questions remained elusive. There was no one who could really answer why there is a universe of matter and how it came to look the way it does. At the start of the 20th century, mathematical physics, inspired by a series of instrumental discoveries in astrophysics, attempted to formulate an answer to the question of how it is that the universe came to be. The resulting story, The Big Bang, was hailed as a triumph of reason and cosmic understanding. But was it really something new? Or was it just a new version of some of the oldest known stories to humanity? This is the story of how the pursuit of beauty the confusion of mathematics for science, and an abiding thirst to know the start of things has permitted the supernatural to persist in a small corner of today's modern scientific canon, cosmological physics. Chapter 1. Why is the human question? Humans are obsessed with cause and effect, a behavior that becomes apparent around the age of two or three when children begin asking why about everything they see around them. In the past, answers to these questions were passed along as stories, oral traditions that acted as mnemonic devices for extending the reach of living memory about things like earthquakes, wars, tsunamis, or volcanic eruptions. But these stories also operated on a much grander scale than seismic and political guidance. Creation myths served as a form of proto-science, the first attempts to produce mechanistic explanations for how everything came to be. The distinguishing factor in these stories is that mythological causality is largely supernatural. Existence begins in darkness, or from chaotic waters, or is hatched from an egg. Omnipotent creators cause all things to come into being, grant them motion, and shepherd them on through their development. And even in the aftermath of creation, divinity remains. Gods are responsible for love, storms, a good harvest, the sun rising and setting, and even for the existence of the stars themselves. Superstition and otherworldly mechanisms were at odds with the hyper-rational awakening of the Enlightenment, and so slowly ceded ground to the new physical mechanisms that were described in the new language of dynamic mathematics. But very quickly it became apparent that although the new equations could describe the behavior of current in a conductor, or the path of a planet across the arc of the sky, they could not actually reach the underlying cause of many phenomena. At first, physicists assumed an invisible ether bathed all objects and mediated the phenomena of electricity, gravity, and light that were described so neatly by mathematics. But when humans failed to detect this elusive substance, as highlighted by the null result of the famed Michelson and Morley experiment, the luminiferous ether was suddenly suspect. Einstein himself hammered the final nail into the ether coffin with his mediatorless theories of relativity, which described the behavior of light and gravity by presenting a model of space-time rendered in sparse and complex mathematics. 
But in the decades since, his equations have been broadly applied not only to invisible phenomena in the laboratory, but also to the central question of human wonder. How did everything get here? Those who turn to physics for these answers are greeted with an otherworldly landscape of points of infinite density and zero volume, dark energy and dark flows, of God particles and a universe born from nothing. Today on Earth, these ideas are widely considered to be scientific, but are they actually mechanistic explanations without any missing frames? Or is the current state of physical cosmology actually a traditional creation myth that has been expertly cloaked in empiricism and presented with the supreme logic of mathematics? And if that is the case, does it matter? Chapter 2. Something from Nothing. We start the story of modern mathematical cosmology with Isaac Newton, who published his magnum opus, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, in 1687. Despite his wide-ranging and often astoundingly accurate quantitative descriptions of light, the laws of motion, and universal gravitation, he drew the line at generating novel hypotheses about the cause of celestial motion. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Though Newton was a mathematical genius who was also into the occults, he ultimately strove to separate his mystical inclinations from a study of natural philosophy. The separation of spirit and science was pretty tenuous. When Michelson and Morley failed to detect the ether, and Einstein was able to accurately describe the motions of bodies in light without a physical mediator, physics very quickly lost its mechanical anchor. This shift had vast implications for physics, especially atomics, but that's for another video. The point today is that the widespread acceptance of science without a physical mechanism laid the groundwork for the emergence of a much more traditional story of the universe. Einstein himself initially eschewed the idea of a mythological birth of the cosmos, instead preferring a static, eternal scenario. But even as he wrote his landmark paper, Cosmological Considerations of the General Theory of Relativity, the findings that would lead to Big Bang cosmology were beginning to emerge. In 1912, American astronomer Vesto Silfer looked out onto the stars and found something unusual. The spectral profiles of many of the most distant nebula he observed were redder than expected. He surmised that this was an optical version of the Doppler effect, that the light was shifted because the objects emitting it were actively moving away from observers on Earth. Then, in 1924, Edwin Hubble, working at the Mount Wilson Observatory, made another startling discovery. Many of the stars in the sky, in fact most of them, lay beyond the spiral arms of the Earth's own galaxy. This was a huge contradiction to the status quo, which assumed that the Milky Way contained the entire universe, the audacity of which forced Hubble to publish his findings in the only journal that would have him, the New York Times. Around the same time, there was another observer of the night sky, a Catholic priest named George Lemaitre, who thought to draw a clear line between Silfer's red-shifted galaxies and Hubble's distance maps to propose a new idea. What if galaxies that were farther away from our own were moving apart faster than those that were closer. This came to be known as Hubble's Law rather than Lemaitre's Law for a variety of reasons. But it's important to note that the expansion of the universe was an instrumental piece for the formation of the modern creation myth. It was a controversial moment. Hubble was never certain that the redshift was indicative of true expansion, as he writes in a letter to Willem de Sitter, a colleague of Einstein's and the director of the Leiden Observatory. We use the term apparent velocities to emphasize the empirical features of the correlation. The interpretation we feel should be left to you and the very few others who are competent to discuss the matter with authority. But Lemaitre was the strong proponent that this redshift at a distance implied universal expansion. And in a letter to Nature in 1931, he laid out his vision. If the world has begun with a single quantum, the notions of space and time would altogether fail to have any meaning at the beginning. 
they would only begin to have a sensible meaning when the original quantum has been divided into a sufficient number of quanta. If this suggestion is correct, the beginning of the world happened a little before the beginning of space and time. We could conceive of the beginning of the universe in the form of a unique atom, the atomic weight of which is the total mass of the universe. Einstein was first dismissive of Lemaitre's theory due to his preference for an eternal and static universe. He was then dismissive on grounds that Lemaitre's theory was so obviously, quote, inspired by the Christian dogma of creation and unjustified at the scientific level, end quote, telling Lemaitre that, quote, the entire deal resembles too much the book of Genesis. We easily see that you are a priest. Despite Lemaitre's theological roots, the theory caught and has been the central story ever since. But as the first atom comes from nothing, it is little more than a version of both ex nihilo creation and of the ancient myth of the world egg, where everything in existence is hatched from a magical object that contains all matter. Chapter 3. Kiss the ring. At some point in the last few hundred years, human scientists made a terrible mistake and equated the awesome power of mathematics with the cause and effect trajectory of an explanation. This confusion was further amplified by the emergence of the belief that mathematics A. is a language and B. that it is the language of the universe, which was popularized by the cult of personality that arose around a group of physicists at the turn of the 20th century. At this point, the legend of the Big Bang is told and retold as a mathematical mantra to new initiates who aspire to one day make a contribution to the legend. And yet, there are whispers, both in the halls of and on the walkways at the base of the ivory tower, that there are significant issues with the mathematics that have been at the center of physics for the last century. Dark matter, dark flow, dark energy, as well as issues with the Hubble constant, where not all galaxies appear to be receding, are well known to those in the field. This leads to two options. The first is to create a Ptolemaic epicycle of adjustments that will allow for foundational theories to stand. And the other is to consider that perhaps the beginning of everything is an inherently supernatural presumption that might have no place in science. Consider the thousands of creation myths all the way back to the Babylonian Enuma Eilish of the 12th century BC describe the universe as being born. Sometimes the earth comes first from darkness, as in Genesis. Other times, matter emerges from water. There are even versions such as the Chinese Dao Yuan, where a concept, the natural order of things, emerges first and then governs everything that happens afterwards. A moment of creation is obviously a human construct, one that reflects the only way that a finite life form can imagine the container in which it spends its whole life. Infinite time and an eternal universe are nearly incomprehensible, perhaps even dissatisfying to a creature that's inexorably defined by birth and death. The story of a ceaseless cosmos is perhaps for this reason so easily supplanted by fantastical narratives that reflect lived experience. Lemaitre himself admitted he was in favor of a universal lifetime because, quote, an infinite one could not really be commensurable to human thought, end quote. He might be right, but difficulty in comprehension is not sufficient reason for cooking the scientific books. It might not even seem like such a big problem to have a myth at the heart of modern science, but when scientists work on understanding nature, each discovery is required to fit together with all others. What this amounts to is that alternative explanations for things like redshift, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and the shape and motion of galaxies can't really be discussed because the case has been closed by consensus. And if mechanisms of how celestial bodies were formed and how they evolved are locked in place by a mythology that is literally etched in stone, then how is it possible to develop increasingly functional explanations? To escape the inevitable cycles of planetary and celestial catastrophe, humans are going to need a flexible epistemological approach to the cosmos. A science that is open to progress and forgiving of past misconceptions is perhaps the only way that humans will be able to reach beyond their present limitations. But instead of repressing the need for myth, what if you lean into it instead? 
as you enter into a time where most evidence can be convincingly faked and capital T truth is farther out of reach than ever, it's the metaphorical stories you carry that might best guide you in your journey from birth to death, day by day. But for the sake of clarity, perhaps consider taking a leaf from Newton's book and keep your myth and your science on separate shelves and in separate containers? The interview that follows moves beyond cosmology and examines mathematical physics in general. This week's guest, Stephen Crothers, is a private investigator who has dedicated himself to policing logical contradictions in foundational papers from the discipline. It was a really illuminating and lively conversation, and we think you'll love it. Also, look out for further physics adventures in the coming weeks, including a look at the surface of the sun with famed pioneer of radiological imaging, Pierre-Marie Robitaille. For next week, though, we're diving into the mysteries of the human mind with an exploration of hypnotism. And we're continuing our study of law and what humans can do to keep their paws on the levers of power. They do have paws, right? If you haven't subscribed already, smash that red button and help us steer this ship. Don't smash it, just press it. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Crothers. Most people seem to find mystical things rather than scientific things more attractive and I don't think scientists are actually in general immune from this. A few examples is that the finite mass of a black hole is concentrated in zero volume, infinite density and infinite gravity. Proponents of black holes believe them, they see them everywhere just like people who believe in ghosts see ghosts working everywhere in mysterious ways. So when their mathematics tells them something, they get all excited and let the natural inclination to mysticism take over. Go to the original sources and analyze them because otherwise you will find that you are just accepting things that are dogmatic. And dogmatism is the death of science.